Hello and welcome to Your New Jersey. I'm Lisa Marie Falvo. On today's show, we'll learn about how JBWS helps victims of domestic abuse. We'll also learn about Manette's Angels and the support they give to breast cancer patients and their families. But first, New Jersey's Pay It Forward program will provide zero interest loans and stipends for students looking to work in healthcare, clean energy, and IT. Joining me now to talk all about this exciting venture is David Sokolow, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. David, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Lisa Marie. Tell us all about this new Pay It Forward program. Well, thanks. This is a first in the nation uh, public-private partnership. Um, nothing like this has been done before. And, and when Governor Murphy launched this uh, just in August, um, we were able to talk about a, a co-investment from eight leading New Jersey corporations, the CEO Council, together with some state funding through my agency um, to create a revolving fund that will train workers in high demand jobs that have good wages in uh, cybersecurity. That's the IT uh, training program that we're funding in the first uh, first iteration of this. We're also doing a nursing training program um, uh, for uh, registered nurse training, as well as a uh, clean energy in welding and HVAC uh, skilled trades. Um, and those trainings will be paid for with this revolving fund. Workers will get a zero interest loan when they're, so they don't have to pay up front for the training. Um, but then they only pay back if they succeed. So they will pay an affordable percentage of wages only after they earn above a certain threshold after the training. Um, and so it will be all upside um, for the workers. And in addition, they get a grant, a grant to pay living costs stipend while they are in training, because presumably when people are in training, they can't work as many hours at their other endeavor, their other job. And so they could cut back on those hours a little bit and still not be out of pocket. So this is a, an opportunity for people to get job training that previously there was not enough funding for and the money will recycle. So we'll be able to train more workers in the future with the same money as people repay those loans. That is one phenomenal program. I mean, everybody loves a win, 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 right? And that is like the definition of that. Talk about the eight private companies that signed on to help you with this. Sure, um, we have uh, uh, this New Jersey CEO Council um, which is Campbell Soup, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Prudential Financial, PSEG, uh, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, Barnabas Health, um, and Verizon, each contributing to this groundbreaking first in the nation program um, led by a, a coalition of these CEOs that came together with Governor Murphy a little more than a year ago to talk about uh, this design. What's in it for them is two things. Obviously, a pipeline of future trained workers who will have the skills they need uh, to, to do jobs that are needed to be done in this economy, but also the notion that their philanthropic donations from those companies um, will stretch further. The money will recycle. Um, and so we were thrilled to have those uh, companies really show corporate leadership, really show an interest uh, in the future of the workforce um, together with uh, Governor Murphy in building a stronger and fairer New Jersey. Why were the healthcare, clean energy, and IT sectors singled out for this program? Yeah, these are the industry sectors that are, are key in uh, Governor Murphy's uh, long-term economic growth strategy developed with our jobs, uh, New Jersey Council, um, which includes lots of input from uh, private sector businesses, from economists, from uh, forecasters about where jobs are growing. Look, we see an enormous need for more nurses. Um, it is a, a huge vacancy rate um, in hospitals and other facilities where nurses are employed. Um, so we've got to build that pipeline. Um, clean energy, in particular, um, offshore wind, New Jersey is going to be the national leader and is poised already to be the national leader in offshore wind and creating a pipeline of skilled workers for those fields 
absolutely crucial to our long-term um, economic uh, benefit and creating jobs that are that are needed for our strategy to combat climate change. Um, and as it relates to cybersecurity, look, every single company of any size has to be guarding against uh, issues related to cybersecurity. It is a more and more sophisticated field, and every single business, for profit and nonprofit, needs cybersecurity expertise. Um, and so, these are job training programs that we vetted very carefully uh, to pick for this program, uh, this funding opportunity, because they have terrific track records in getting people today jobs paying uh, above average wages um, in a relatively short uh, training program, you know, one year to two years, and you can be making 60, 70, $80,000 a year um, in various fields, um, various jobs in these three fields. Where does this training take place? Right. So our cybersecurity program is being delivered by New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, in Newark. Um, our um, HVAC and welding, uh, clean energy related uh, uh, skills training programs are at Camden County College. And the nursing program that was selected for this first round is at Hudson County College. And so those three programs are the first ones that we're doing this with. We're going to test this proof of concept and workers should go to those institutions and ask to enroll in those programs. And if they have a funding gap, if there's no other money to pay for their job training or their skills course, um, then this money can essentially uh, fill in that gap. I want to say this. We've already done a lot through grant money, through direct student grants to help people pay for college, to help make college more affordable. Governor Murphy started the Community College Opportunity Grant and the Garden State Guarantee. For many people, the cost of tuition is, is almost all covered. For some people, it's tuition free to go to college in New Jersey. But there are programs which uh, there's still a gap. And these programs, we will fill that gap with these pay it forward loans. How are you getting the word out to prospective students that this program is available to them? Well, we're certainly grateful, Lisa Marie, for the opportunity to talk to you to help get the word out. Um, but we're very much relying uh, in each of the cases in the industry sectors. We have the, the partnership with the CEO Council, um, which is, is getting the word out to people who are applying uh, for employment with them, but also through the schools themselves. You know, these schools are constantly telling us that they, NJIT, Hudson County Community College, Camden County College, all three of them say that there are people who come interested in those programs, but they can't finance it. They can't afford it themselves. Here's a new financing option. And so this will enable them to meet that demand of students for these really high quality training programs. David, where can people find out more about Pay It Forward? So it is uh, njpayitforward.org and urge you to go uh, to that webpage and learn more about this first in the nation program. Congratulations to you and your department, Governor Murphy, the eight CEOs that agreed to participate in this on something really amazing for the citizens here in the Garden State. Thanks, Lisa Marie, appreciate it. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and the Jersey Battered Women's Service of Morris County provides resources to women who are suffering. Here to tell us more is its president and CEO, Diane Williams. Diane, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, especially during October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I could tell you a little bit about JBWS, where I'm the CEO. We actually started back in 1976, where there wasn't much acknowledgement that domestic violence was an issue, especially in Morris County. And so there was a group of women that got together and decided to start their own helpline and 24 seven shelter so that there would be a safe place for victims of domestic violence to go and a 24 seven helpline for people who are in need of resources to reach out. And so fast forward 45 years later, 
you know, we celebrated our 45th anniversary last year, and we're actually one of the largest domestic violence organizations in the state of New Jersey. And it's not because Morris County has more of an issue than anywhere else in the state. It's really because as a community and as an organization, we've decided to really throw everything that we can at the issue from emergent services like our safe house and our helpline, our crisis response team, to prevention work that we're doing in the schools, but also in our corporation and our community, uh, as well as counseling and supportive services, both for victims of domestic violence, their children, but also that are those that are actually using abuse and choosing to use abuse in their relationships, because we recognize if we're not really working with those that are using abuse, domestic violence will never end. It will just find another victim. Talk to us about the resources victims receive from JBWS. Sure. And so what I started to talk about earlier are emergent services. We have a safe house where families typically reside up to about 90 days. Prior to COVID, the stay was less time, but because of the lack of affordable housing, especially in Morris County, but throughout the state of New Jersey, it really takes longer for survivors and their kids to find a safe place to go. So we have that safe house. We have a 24 seven helpline. We also have something called transitional housing where survivors and their children can stay for up to two years. And that's 11 fully furnished apartments where they can work on recovering both from the trauma that they experienced, but they can also focus on trying to increase their ability to earn income so that they're going to be successful and sustainable out in the community. In regard to our counseling services, we provide group counseling for the survivors of domestic violence and children, children's counseling. We have trauma-focused specific counseling uh, really focused on decreasing the symptoms that you might see in a uh, young child or an adolescent that experienced domestic violence or witnessed domestic violence. And then we have something called our uh, Morris Family Justice Center, and that's really the first public facing location for JBWS. It's not a confidential location. It's located in the administrative offices next to the courthouse. And someone can just walk in off the street and have access to our services, whether it's shelter, getting connected to counseling, trying to figure out how they can, or if they can file a restraining order. There's 11 on-site partners that partner with us so that they can come just to one location and be able to access all of those resources from housing to social services to sexual assault counseling. Uh, the probation office is our partner, certainly the County of Morris, the prosecutor's office, a myriad of services, the Office of Hispanic Affairs that are really able to provide services and supports to those that are seeking services or just wanna know what kind of services are available to them. Yeah, we also have our Jersey Center for Nonviolence, and those are the services that are geared specifically for those that are using abuse in their relationships. So that's available for all genders, and it's also available in Spanish, and really there's just that recognition that we're trying to be inclusive with the services that we are providing so that all that need services can get the ones that they need. In regard to prevention services, we educate about 10,000 students in Morris County on an annual basis about healthy dating relationships. And we also will go out and do lunch and learns in our corporations and talk about what it looks like when domestic violence shows up at work, what you can do if you think your colleague or someone that you supervise might be experiencing domestic violence and how you can intervene safely. And so really the, the last one of the last things that we do is community education and training for some of our first responders, paramedics, uh, the police department, emergency medical room personnel, so that they can recognize the signs of somebody who's experienced domestic violence and be able to intervene safely and provide resources to them. And we also are really active legislatively. So I will testify in front of the Senate and the assembly in regard to the need for funding for domestic violence services across the state. 
as well as when there's any sort of legislation you know, that might be proposed that might impact somebody who has experienced domestic violence, we will certainly advocate in that way as well. So you mentioned how you educate the public as to what the signs of domestic violence are. Can you educate our audience on that? Absolutely. And so one of the myths I think that is out there is that domestic violence is really about just physical abuse. And it's really goes beyond that. And we're talking about emotional abuse, put downs. Um, we're talking about verbal abuse, name calling, technological abuse, someone who is incessantly calling or reading your email or going on your social media to somebody who's tracking you through your technology. I mean, excessive jealousy. There are so many ways that abuse can be disguised and people don't even recognize that they're a victim of abuse. And so really we encourage anyone who is unsure, maybe, you know, sometimes hearing the word abuse makes people shy away from recognizing that and just thinking maybe I'm in an unhealthy relationship. And you can reach out to our 877-ARE-YOU-ABUSED hotline number, helpline number, and be able to just talk to somebody about, you know, what you're experiencing, what sorts of services and supports there are available for you. I know that there is also a stereotype among the demographics of domestic abuse, but in speaking to mayors and, and people in higher government, there's no discrimination when it comes to domestic violence. And really it's among the affluent that keep it a secret more, which Morris County has a lot of those communities. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. So domestic violence is one of those issues that crosses all socioeconomic lines, ethnicities, religions. Really nobody is safe from the issue of domestic violence. And survivors of domestic violence, victims of domestic violence, they look like you, they look like me. Um, so it could be anyone, it could be your friend, your family member, your neighbor. And uh, one of the things about that certainly women of affluence and education that have experienced domestic violence say sometimes as a barrier to them is shame. You know, that they have a hard time stepping forward and, and saying, you know, I have all of this education and all of these resources and still I was a victim of domestic violence. It's, it can happen so covertly, it sneaks up on you that really people don't see it coming. And sometimes they're already so far in that it's really hard for them to get out, but there's always a way out. Diane, thank you so much for coming on during this very important Domestic Violence Awareness Month and sharing all the resources that JBWS provides for Morris County and, and really beyond. Thank you, thank you so much. And just remember, October 20th is Purple Thursday. So everyone wear your purple, find us on social media and proudly say that you stand with survivors of domestic violence. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Manette's Angels is a foundation that supports breast cancer patients, survivors, and their families. Founder of Manette's Angels, Ken McKenna, joins us now. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and Manette's Angels does a lot of awareness and so much more for people, unfortunately, going through this. Tell us about your mission. So, um, Manette's Angels, I started um, in 2004 after my wife, Manette, passed away. Um, Manette was a registered nurse and um, very much important to her was caring for her patients. And that continued after she was diagnosed and that she tried to reach out and support breast cancer patients, especially those that had just been diagnosed. And we've continued with that focus. Um, the core of the mission are what we call our acts of kindness. And acts of kindness may take many different forms. They may be a dinner and a movie for a family. They may be manicures and pedicures, uh, supermarket gift cards, dinners, transportation, um, flowers at the holidays, all different ways to try and help people get through their treatment phase. Such beautiful work, and I'm so sorry for your loss of Manette. 
What gave you the idea, though, through your morning and taking care of three children to put a foundation together? Well, I had a good friend of mine um, who encouraged me to do this. A year after Manette passed away, we did a, a small um, celebration um, in her memory and um, got a lot of good response. And um, so my friend Walter encouraged me to, uh, to start the foundation. He actually drafted all the legal documents and all of those bits and pieces. But it was really about giving back. Um, you know, from the minute Minette got diagnosed, we were involved in breast cancer events through the American Cancer Society, through Komen, North Jersey, um, different places. And she became a spokesperson for a number of entities. So we just wanted to keep on doing as much as we possibly could. Talk about the different ways Manette's Angels provides assistance for women undergoing treatment. So as I say, they're, they're the acts of kindness primarily. It's not um, direct financial support, if you will, but it's to try and help them get through those points in time. Um, we've done a number of things. Um, we've partnered with the Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston and Trinitas Hospital in Elizabeth. And there we're providing mammograms um, lymphedema sleeves, uh, mastectomy bras, prosthesis um, for um, in uninsured and underinsured individuals to try and help them um, get the best care they possibly can. You also provide scholarships for high school students who want to become nurses and for students who have been impacted by breast cancer. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, so, so we have three different scholarship programs. Um, Manette and I met at Seton Hall University, so we have a scholarship for someone in the Seton Hall University College of Nursing. Um, year um, so far, we've given out over fifty thousand dollars in scholarships to nursing um, students, and in addition to that, we give out a scholarship to a high school senior in Verona, which is where um, we lived and started the foundation and raised our children. We also recently started an impact scholarship, and that scholarship goes to a high school senior who has been affected by breast cancer, either a mother, grandmother, aunt, whatever it might be. How do you raise money for all of these different initiatives? So we have a number of events coming up um, that actually help us to raise those money. During the pandemic, I made the decision that we weren't really going to be actively fundraising uh, as we have in the past. Um, but we're very fortunate in that we've um, generated a following of people who sent us money um, unsolicited. Um, so we've been very fortunate. But we actually have um, coming up this month, um, we've partnered with Cedar Grove Recreation Department um, and we're doing a walk with them. It's the eighth annual Rare, Real Panthers Wear Pink Walk um, at Panther Park in Cedar Grove. It's on October 20th. Um, and then we have our annual tea um, on November 13th that we've been doing for several years. That's held at the Montclair Golf Club in West Orange. And then next year will be the 20th um, anniversary of Manette's passing. And we'll be doing a grand cocktail reception on May 10th at the Park Savoy Estate in Florham Park. And then along the way, we do a lot of education and awareness events that also raise some money. So we partner with a number of high school um, athletic departments. And so we'll be at football games, we'll be at volleyball tournaments, we'll be at cheerleading events. Um, and there's multi-purpose in that, yes, we will raise a little bit of money, but more importantly is to educate, raise the awareness about breast health um, with an emphasis on early detection, which is the key. Absolutely. Well, I know your story personally has a happy ending. I, I've said this in the past. Um, I lost my first wife to breast cancer, and I actually met my current wife through breast cancer. My wife, Kathy, is one of the co-founders of the uh, Komen North Jersey affiliate. After Manette passed, I started to get involved um, with Komen and uh, met Kathy, and we've been married. We just celebrated actually 15 years uh, this past week. And um, she has been um, a tremendous help in raising the level at which Manette's Angels does business. Um, our, our All of our collateral materials, 
um, a lot of how we approach things is as a result of all of her years of fundraising experience with not-for-profits. So um, we would not be where we are today without her help. Where can people find out more about you and Manette's Angels and all of these events you have coming up? Sure. So our website, which is, is uh, just been redone, is www.minettesangels.org. Um, and they can go there or they can email me directly. It's Ken, K-E-N, at minettesangels.org. And I would love to hear from them. Ken, thank you so much for coming on here. You're really a gem of a person that I've gotten to know over the years. I know you're also a big supporter of this program, and I'm happy you took the time today to come on. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Your New Jersey. I'm Lisa Marie Falbo. We'll see you back here next week.